It gives me great pleasure to introduce our plenary speaker tonight, Dr. Dallas Willard, a philosophy professor for just years and years at the USC campus in Southern California. Uh, just a brilliant philosopher and really a, a person we look to for philosophical wisdom on a regular basis from our perch at Biola University. But more than that, it turns out he is an amazing disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ who passes along his wisdom in following the Lord to the rest of us. I don't know how many of us at Biola kind of consider him our guru if it's kosher to have a guru. Uh, it, would, it would probably be Dallas Willard. Like the Apostle Paul said, you know, uh, follow me as I follow Christ. I think I want to follow Dallas Willard as he follows Christ. Christ too. And, and I want to follow any of you who follow Christ. But this guy has a special twist on this and some wisdom to bring to us tonight that I can't wait to hear. Dr. Dallas Willard. Well, it's wonderful to be here, and I'm so glad to have a chance to be a part of this meeting. I must say I am astonished at the number and enthusiasm and at the quality of the people who are going to be speaking to you, myself accepted. Um, uh, I, I don't find myself very amazing. But uh, I'm thankful to have this opportunity now. And you have some notes, and uh, I hope you can pull those out. I will go along pretty closely to what they say. Um, uh, and uh, I, I think I'm going to be presenting something a little different from uh, what you may find uh, f in your mind fits in with apologetics. I think it's very important, and uh, I'm, I may say some things that put a different slant on apologetics, and if you uh, hear me doing that, well, you have real experts here in apologetics, so you should believe what they say. <laughs> okay. But I want to talk to you this evening about knowledge in the context of spiritual formation. And let me just explain briefly by spiritual formation, I'm referring to Christian spiritual formation because there are many, many kinds of spiritual formation. Spiritual formation is like an education. Everyone gets one. It's just a question of which one you get. Hitler had a spiritual formation, and so did Mother Teresa. Every person you meet has had one, and you've had one. And actually, what we are really talking about in the Christian context when we talk about spiritual formation is spiritual transformation. We're talking about the process of becoming like Jesus Christ in all dimensions of your personality. And uh, the spiritual life is the life that you live interactively with God. Uh, sometimes we talk about it just as if it were inward and secret, and part of it is, but if you think it's only inward, in inward uh, you really haven't got the idea yet, because the transformation is absolutely obvious, absolutely outward. You can't keep it in. And uh, what I really want to talk to you about this evening is the role of knowledge in the spiritual life. Now, you know, um, not all that many years ago, uh, the phrase uh, evangelical philosophical society would have been treated as an oxymoron. <laughs> that they are words that don't go together. And actually, there are many people that still think that, some of them are in the church, and some of them are outside the church. <laughs> uh, but it's a wonderful thing to see uh, you putting these words together. But um, Christian spiritual life is not commonly thought of as one involving or providing knowledge in any essential way or to any significant degree. It is often thought of as involving faith, 
but that is thought of as, as opposed to knowledge, or grace, or gift, or divine upholding, possibly some enthusiasm. But it is not regarded as a life conducted in terms of knowledge, of realities involved, and of how they work, nor is it thought of as providing such knowledge that could be shared with others aspiring to live a spiritual life, nor indeed with those who are skeptical of the spiritual life, or who perhaps even flatly deny there is anything to the so-called spiritual life beyond the psychological and sociological realities and states of those caught up in what goes by that name. So there's a problem with bringing this into the domain of knowledge. And I want to make sure to present this as a part of apologetical work. Now, you can think of some outstanding cases of people who had a spiritual life. You might think of Billy Graham or Mother Teresa of Calcutta. Uh, you might think of Bonhoeffer, who's recently, thank God, been back in the public eye. Um, the Catholic churches talk of saints, and to be a saint, you have to have a certain number of demonstrable miracles. See, that's interaction with the supernatural being of God. And that idea of interacting with God as you yourself go through the process of change and growth towards Christ-likeness is vital to understanding the spiritual life and spiritual formation. Now, many people have turned away from the Christian church into other spiritualities. And it's a really uh, educational, and I get my students to do this, to go to Barnes & Noble, can't say borders anymore, <laughs> or some of the other big bookstores, and go to the section labeled spirituality and look at what is there. Another thing you can do is Google up spirituality and you add almost any word you want to add. And you will get hundreds of thousands of hits on things like spirituality and sports. Or spirituality and business. Or spirituality and dating. And uh, so the hunger for another world Another source of life is something that is ever-present around us, and a lot of it comes from the sense that somehow Christians really aren't into spirituality. And you have a common saying among many people in our population, well, uh, I'm not religious, but I'm very spiritual. See. And that points to a huge hunger and vacuum in the lives of people. And what I'm hopeful this evening is to help us move away from a kind of non-cognitive attitude towards spirituality, towards the spiritual life in the Christian tradition. And I need to say that this is not new. It's only new in the context of the recent past. But knowledge of the spiritual life is standard for the history of the Christian church. It is because in the recent past, there has been a progressive negotiation of Christian teaching and Christian life out of the category of knowledge and reality into the, knowledge, into the category of something called faith. Faith. And faith is a way of dismissing the teachings of the Christian church and its history. Uh, you go back and you look at people like Augustine and Aquinas and Luther and Calvin and Edwards and Wesley, and indeed the great 19th century and early 20th century American theologians. And you see them presenting 
not just Christian doctrine generally, but the understanding of spiritual life as a place that operates by knowledge and provides knowledge to those who wish to know. So I'm going to be shifting that around if I can at all, and we have to acknowledge that much that has been claimed by Christians to be knowledge was actually not knowledge, and the discovery and admission of this fact was a major factor in the massive social and historical displacement that I have just mentioned. Such mistaken claims were, of course, especially common for the denominational distinctives. The things that tend to separate Christians into groups tend not to qualify as knowledge, but as tradition. And the discovery of this in the American past has been one of the things that has pushed Christianity out of the intellectual context that we have to recover if we're going to think about apologetics in any sense. I'm going to narrow the sense down a little bit for me, but it concerns knowledge. If you don't have knowledge on the basis of which you do apologetics, I ask you, what are you doing? And that is something worth exploring and watching uh, how people conduct themselves in the context of Christian leadership and teaching. You see, knowledge is important in any area of human endeavor. It matters because the role of knowledge in human life is vital and irreplaceable. And when we come to talk about faith as Christians, we don't want to understand that as something that is opposed to knowledge. It has a different role, and it's very important, but certainly if you look at the biblical employment of faith, you'll see that it is a kind of confidence that is environed in knowledge. The prophet said, my people perish for lack of knowledge. Knowledge is essential. And it is important because in all of the activities of life, we need to be able to con confidently access truth. Truth is what enables us to interact successfully with reality. Truth is like the aim of a gun. If you use it rightly, you'll hit what you're aiming at. If, it, if you don't have truth, who knows what you'll hit. But knowledge is important because it involves truth and it involves open method. And that is not the case with mere belief, commitment, tradition, power, or anything else but knowledge. Truth, knowledge, open method allows us to find common ground. And I ask you again, if when you do your apologetic work, you cannot work on common ground with people, what are you doing? Now, I understand some people believe that only divine lightning changes people. So that when you are preaching or working in apologetics, you're just making an occasion in which God might strike. And there's a lot of deep philosophy and theology there. I just want to acknowledge it. And I want to say that for my part, in apologetics, we are bringing knowledge to bear on genuine questions from people who really want to know. So knowledge is vital. And knowledge of the spiritual life is a subcategory of that. And evidence drawn from the life of Christians who are growing in their relationship to God and becoming more and more equipped to live in God's kingdom with him, that kind of knowledge is among the most precious knowledge on earth. And so we want to talk about the knowledge of the spiritual life. We want, of course, to stand on, a, on solid ground we don't fake knowledge. We don't pretend we have it when we don't, if we can keep from it. We want the real thing. 
And that is why a key to all of our work as apologetics, in apologetics, is openness. And we come to meet people on, with, the, with the idea that I am here to learn if there's something for me to learn. I'm not here just to tell you how it is. I may do a little of that too, but then I'm open to an exchange with you as we operate on the basis of knowledge and common ground. And one of the things that makes the unbeliever really nervous is the idea that there is a common ground where they can meet with those who disagree with them and have beliefs about Christ and it begins to show itself in their life and then the question arises, how can people be like that? And that is the initial impulse of apologetics in the New Testament. We'll come to that in a moment. Well, let me say a little bit about how all of this knowledge of the spiritual life comes into the area of Christian apologetics. Now, that's on my understanding. And if I say something different from what Paul said or what Bill Craig or any of the other distinguished people here, just write me off because actually, you know, I'm not, I guess, much of an expert in this field. I feel deeply about it and I practice it uh, in the way I shall try to describe it. So how does this work, uh, this idea of knowledge of the spiritual life? Okay. And remember, when I say that, I mean knowledge in terms of which I live the spiritual life. Right? And then knowledge of what happens in the spiritual life that is available to others. And I'll try to make that clearer as we go along. So, how does this knowledge of the spiritual life that expresses itself in formation, spiritual formation, uh, how does it fit in with the task of the Christian apologist? What exactly is it that we do in apologetics? Now, answering this question is not a simple matter if we are to take as our guide what is actually done by outstanding people in the field. One of my favorite authors of the not too distant past is a man named A.B. Bruce, and he wrote a wonderful, much used book that is entitled apologetics or Christianity defensively stated. But now, is apologetics an essentially defensive project? Or is it a helping ministry? Christian evidences are that's a crucial field to work in. And we need good people who do that, who lay the evidence out and make it public. But I'm thinking apologetics is more answering questions. Now, there is a time for defense. And we are, of course, admonished by the New Testament to contend earnestly for the faith that was once for all handed down to the saints. But that is perhaps a good deal more than just defending. I wonder if we should not keep this work of the apology uh, out of the category of defending. We want to allow there is a job to be done of defending. But it may well be that the work of the apology is most effectively done not in response to someone who is attacking, but someone who is asking, inquiring. Why are you hopeful when you're suffering unjustly? What makes you tick? That's a question. not an attack. So I'm just suggesting we think about that some. So I would like to think of apologetics as providing insight and knowledge to answers 
uh, to questions posed by serious inquirers who genuinely wish to understand what followers of Christ believe and practice and why they do that. Now, I have put on your sheet on number four the classic passage, passage in the New Testament. If indeed you suffer because of righteousness, you are blessed. This is 1 Peter 3, 14 and 15. Do not fear their intimidation and don't be upset. Just hold Christ as Lord in a special place in your hearts, being always prepared to explain to everyone who asks you why and how you have the hope that is in you. Now imagine for a moment, what would it be like if the primary task or a large part of the task of the apology was to explain why Christians are so happy and so full of righteous deeds and love that people say, what's going on there? And then the task would be to come and explain what is going on in the life of the person who is joyful under unjust persecution. Don't you think that's an interesting question? Now there's a place in that question for Christian evidences. It would be in response to a person who genuinely wants to know. And there is a place for dealing with people who don't want to know. And I must say, in this room, there is a man who is absolutely powerful in doing that. Perhaps there's more than one man. I'm thinking of Bill Craig. See, that is, he speaks to people who don't want to know. <laughs> and he makes them wish they did. <laughs> and that has happened all over the country. Not just in the wonderful little DVD here. But I get these reports. I get reports from campuses where people tell me they can't even get someone to talk to him because they know what has happened to people who talk to them. <laughs> That's wonderful, right? And there is a place for that. And actually, I think one could build a case for saying that often people who act like they don't want to know really do want to know. So, when you look at this passage, let's think of it in terms of someone who is looking at a person who has a spiritual life of such presence and power that they really want to know. That's where knowledge of how the spiritual life is vital. How would you explain to someone who really wanted to know why a person who is suffering unjustly, perhaps for their faith or just for righteousness' sake, why are they so happy? Now, of course, Jesus said, blessed are you when people persecute you for righteousness' sake. But you know, for most people, that's blessedness is not the first thing that comes to their mind in connection with a situation like that. How do you get to the place? How do you get to the place to where doing things that are wrong aren't even attractive. You can get to that place. And we need to get to that place. And knowledge of the spiritual life concerns that process of spiritual formation by which Christ, Christians stand out, as Paul says in Philippians 2, like lights in a darkened world. Now, where you have people who are standing out like that, it changes everything. Changes evangelism. 
changes Christian teaching, changes apologetics. So that's what we want to think about. How do you get to that place? What is the process? Is there knowledge of how that works? Well, knowledge in the spiritual life concerns two different things. It concerns knowledge of the process of spiritual living. And if you go back a hundred years, you will find book after book that was published and widely read that presented knowledge of Christian living. It's a wonderful old book called The Christian Secret of the Happy Life. Read it. It presents knowledge. It's not a book of exhortation. See, if you don't present knowledge, you're left in a position of trying to get people to do things. And I really think that's not a good position to be in. If you get people to do things to become Christians, they'll go to church, maybe, where there will have to be a man or a woman who keeps getting them to do things they don't want to do. If you bring knowledge of a reality that they are able to enter into and make it a part of their lives, then they'll be coming to you saying, what shall I do? A Christian walk based on knowledge of the spiritual life is, a, is an entirely different kind of thing than one that is based upon being persuaded to do things. To provide knowledge is to lay an entirely different foundation. So the first thing that the spiritual life, knowledge in the spiritual life concerns is knowledge of the process. But then there is knowledge of the God who is active in and around the experience of the one leading this life in interaction with God. The lives of the saints, to speak simply, present themselves as something worthy of inquiry, a subject matter to be understood by themselves and others. It is at least an interesting hypothesis that such lives are lived on the basis of knowledge gained by engaging with the spiritual realm of God, including God, his activities, his kingdom, his word. Another great question for those of us who are evangelicals is, what does the Bible actually do to you? And how do you make it work? Because we have multitudes of people in our churches that take the Bible like they take pills. Just a little nibble, and hopefully it will do them some good. It doesn't do them much good at all, if any, because they're not entering it as a a domain of knowledge about their lives that they're living that can be checked and verified by anyone who wishes to do it. Now, this knowledge, of course, can be communicated to others because knowledge is that sort of thing. It is open. It is available to people who wish to know. Another thing about knowledge is if you don't want to know, you don't have to. Knowledge will not chase you down the street and jump down your throat. If you want to have knowledge of algebra, you have to seek it. Seeking is the nature of gaining knowledge. You have to seek it. And if you have a person who's not seeking it, they won't get it. In classes, they'll just learn what you want them to say, and then they'll say that. And then they'll forget that as soon as they're out. But knowledge comes into possession of the life. It gives direction if a person wants it. So knowledge of God and His kingdom comes with knowledge of the spiritual life. Patrick Sherry, some years ago, published a book titled Spirit, Saints, and Immortality. In it, he argued, in the words of John Hick on the blurb on the back of the book, he argued that the fruit of religious faith in human life 
And I would not go so easy on that, I would say, of Christian faith in human life, and particularly the production of the spiritual and moral giants whom we call saints must constitute important religious evidence. And I would want to argue that in the absence of that kind of evidence, everything else that is offered will be weak in its effect. You have to see the reality in the lives of people. What we now call spiritual formation is an area of spiritual activity that must either be a field of actual and potential knowledge or not. To regard it as not subject to knowledge and as not yielding knowledge is to deprive it of all or almost all significance for human endeavor and Christian practice. Well, let's see how am I doing here on my time. Now, when I speak of knowledge of the spiritual life and of non-physical or spiritual world um, that such a spiritual life interacts with, I mean that ability to represent, speak of, deal with, deal with that life and the world as it is on an appropriate basis of thought and experience not understood in such a way as to exclude authority. Knowledge on the basis of good authority is the most common kind of knowledge. Probably most of us in this room believe the multiplication tables on authority. I doubt that there are many here who have actually worked them through and know on the basis of their experience that they're true. Now there's nothing wrong with knowing things by authority if it's good authority, and good authority, among other things, is always authority that is open to question and further examination. And that pushes it back into this area of knowledge as I'm describing. Let me just say that again. By knowledge, I mean the ability to represent, speak of, and deal with whatever the subject matter is, as it is on an appropriate basis of thought and experience. And so the spiritual life is actually a process of coming to know. One person described prayer as theological research. And that's what it is. In prayer, you come to know God. You come to know how God acts and how he works. And you learn that you can introduce others into that. That prayer does not mean that you already have great faith. Great faith. Sometimes the most effective prayers are a cry of despair. And it is amazing how many people have come to know Jesus Christ by praying the atheist prayer. Oh my God, if there is a God, save my soul if I have a soul. And it is amazing how many people have been converted when they prayed that prayer. But they were in a position where they really wanted to know. And actually, you can sort of think that God's address is the end of your rope. And when you get there, and you really want to know, you will come to know. So we need to understand that knowledge itself is not esoteric and it's not rare. It's one of the most common things in life. And a large part of the intellectual establishment as it now exists, a large part of what it does, is undermine people's confidence that they can know. And that's a long story which I I shouldn't try to go into. So, Uh, There are domains in the spiritual life that cannot be known. There is a place for faith. Faith means you're ready to act as if what you believed is true. That's what faith is. Now, you don't have to know in order to do that. Thank God you don't have to know. And belief is picked up like lint and viruses by little children 
and by big children. And sometimes they're good and sometimes they're not. And actually, one of the main tasks of the apology is to help people get over a lot of beliefs they picked up like lint and viruses and are controlling their lives and they can't get free of them. See, most people live at the mercy of their ideas. And that's where the apology comes. And perhaps they start out just by listening. And they find out what genuine questions the person has. And it would be wonderful if some of those questions were, you know, my roommate is a person full of hope and joy and is totally honest. How do you get that way? Now, there's a place to start in, you see. So, no, if we can acknowledge the role of knowledge and leave the room for faith, and put them together in such a way that faith is operating in a context of knowledge and knowledge in a context of faith. See, you can know what you believe and you can believe what you know. Some people don't believe what they know. A gambler is typical of people who don't believe what they know, as also cheerleaders. <laughs> you know, you're 85 points behind and there's three minutes left. <laughs> We're gonna win! <laughs> Well, actually, there are a lot of situations where that shows up. But we need to put our knowledge and our faith together. And we do that when we approach the Christian life experimentally, watching how our faith develops, how our knowledge develops, uh, learning things like, for example, that Christian disciplines actually do change your life. For example, um, fasting, just to mention a case. Uh, fasting is really an important discipline because it trains you to be strong and sweet when you don't get what you want. Try it. You see, it trains you out of the habits of having to have what you want. That is a crucial element in the spiritual life, and there are disciplines that help you get there. Now, actually, if you get to where you don't have to have what you want, that's going to solve a lot of other problems. For example, depression and disappointment. You don't have to live in disappointment and depression, but if you are not able to surrender your desires to God, you will, and probably you wind up being mad at God. See, that's the sort of thing you learn. Now, as Christian thinkers, apologists, philosophers, this means that we have to rework the idea of knowledge and help people rework it. I can't say a lot about that tonight, but I do want to mention it because it's so important. I've already given a description I think is adequate to knowledge as it really works in life. But then there are the philosophical issues and we have to go back to those. And thank goodness we have a lot of people that can help us with that uh, in coming to an appropriate understanding of what it is to know and getting us over this kind of bland and pervasive skepticism that infects nearly all of our atmosphere in our world today and cuts the sinew of knowledge to the satisfaction of many people who would like to manipulate us. But we have wonderful people who are doing, have done and are doing such great work. Um, someone mentioned Al Plantinga already, I think, but uh, Bill Alston, for example, has uh, done wonderful work in the area in a book that he calls Perceiving God, uh, which deals with this issue of perception of God in the spiritual life. And so there is that level 
and we need to go to that level for people who have the questions. Because many people will look at you, and if you turn out to be happy and, uh, and honest and all of that, they'll say, well, you know, people are odd. Right? That's where we need to be able to dig deeper. We need to come to an understanding of knowledge of the spiritual life. And then we need to be able to present that as something that is accessible to others who want to know. And again, I emphasize that. Because you got, these are totally different cases where you've got someone who doesn't want to know and someone who does want to know. And we need to have a ministry to both of those groups. The experience of the realities of the spiritual life are things that we can have knowledge of and we can open the door to knowledge on the part of others. Now, this is well brought out, I think, by a famous passage in Pascal's Pensees, number 233. This is the passage of the famous wager. And uh, the wager, you remember, is uh, Pascal's challenge to the Sharpies around Paris, who thought they were so smart. And uh, so he presents them with a proposition about what they should bet on. They love to bet uh, in terms of the existence or non-existence of God. And there's a ton of philosophical literature on this, as you would expect. Uh, but basically, the idea is that if you consider what you can win and what you can lose by betting or not betting on the existence of God, it will be clear that you're smart to bet on God's existence. Well, he's talking in uh, Ponce 233 to a person who has heard him and has become convinced that this is true, uh, but he can't just can't believe, and Pascal directs him into the way of experience opened by simple steps that can be taken. Pascal says, endeavor then to convince yourself, not by increase of proofs of God, but by the abatement of your passions. Learn of those who have been bound like you and who now stake all their provisions on God. These are people who know the way which you would follow and who are cured of an ill of which you would be cured. Follow the way by which they began, by acting as if they believed, taking the holy water, having masses said, and of course, that referring to his background, and so forth. Even just this will naturally make you believe and deaden your scruples. Now, um, I would want to say that you need to broaden that out. But can we, as apologies for Christ, give people information about how they can begin to experience the spiritual life? Or perhaps we're so bound up on various points of doctrine that we think if they don't pass that, they can't go in. And we underestimate the readiness of God to meet people where they are. Um, the way of experience is open to everyone. It is a way of grace. Probably without grace, you'd never do it. But you don't have to worry about that. The grace is available. If we step into it, then we begin to experience grace because grace is God acting in our lives to accomplish what we can't accomplish on our own. We begin to experience it. And we can encourage people to believe that they will experience it. I wish I had time to give a lot of biblical illustrations of that and so on, uh, but I don't. Pascal says to his interlocutor, at each step you take on this road, you will see so great certainty of gain, so much nothingness in what you risk, that you will, will, you will at last recognize that you have wagered for something certain and infinite for which you have given nothing. Now what he's saying is that will come through the progress of your experience when you put what 
little faith you may have managed together with the grace of God to move forward in the spiritual life. Now, of course, many people will never accept it, and we have to accept that, but I believe we can be a great service to people if we begin to encourage them on the basis of our knowledge of how the spiritual life works to step into the spiritual life as best they can and make a start. But we have to have knowledge of that or we can't do it. And we have to be confident of that knowledge or we can do it. Now, that, the spiritual life of the Christian, is a way of knowledge, and now I'm going to pull a scripture on you, uh, is made plain by a well-known statement of Jesus. Here's what he said. If you dwell in my teachings, then you really are my apprentices. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. That, as you know, is John 8, 31 through 32. Now, this does not say the truth will make you free. Never say that Jesus said that. He did not say that. The truth will more likely make you flee. (laughs) You don't come to the truth head on. You come to Jesus. And you take his teaching and his life as best you can, and you step into it as his student. Now, we have the truth will make you free all over the place. Our elevator in our humanities building at SC says the truth will make you free. Well, whoever donated the elevator thought it was nice to say that. But Jesus never said that. Jesus said, if you dwell in my words. Now, that's not a nonstop Bible study. That's taking what he said and living in it in life. If you dwell in my word, minnow, the word that is used there, is used repeatedly in John. For example, how the branch dwells in the vine and so on. Then you will go through a course of experience and you will come to know the truth. And the truth known will set you free because you will be able to deal with reality as it is. And that means what's good you will be able to appropriate and what's bad you can avoid. That passage is actually about being free from sin. And if you smarten up a bit, sin will really look different. And your habits can change in the course of experience and you will be made free. That's the course of the spiritual life. That's knowledge about how the spiritual life works, and it is available to everyone who wants to know. Well, of course, all of this is tremendously important now for the blossoming of spiritual formation as something that our churches talk about. And... uh, Talbot is not only world famous for apologetics, but also for being a leader in this field of spiritual formation. It's now an area of great and growing emphasis among Christians and Christian institutions. Both churches and institutions of higher education recognize or have the recognition of the deplorable condition of Christian character or maturity. And that is a theme, of course, consistently harped upon by our people who take surveys and publish polls, Mr. Barna and others, constantly hammering on that. What accounts for this condition? I would say that in a large part, it is to be accounted for in terms of the failure to approach the spiritual life as an area of reliable knowledge which we can own and act on and which we can offer to others who wish to know. Now, there are other factors involved. Satan is always on the job. Uh, There are all kinds of opposing forces, 
But until we have provided what Christ is talking about as dwelling in his word and made sense of it in the spiritual life, then we have another way of explaining it than just the devil made me do it. Okay, I must close. So let me just close with this thought. Now suppose that there were abundant evidence in the lives of Christians of the reality of God and of the spiritual life that they're living with him. Do you think that would make the task of the apologete easier, more effective? In the absence of that, aren't we fighting an uphill and often a losing battle as we try to minister to people that the whole range of activities from evangelism and Christian evidences and apologetics and Christian teaching. You see, what is the ultimate evidence of the reality of God and the kingdom of God in our lives is a person who is living the life. That doesn't mean there aren't other things to do. It means that no matter what else you do, you're going to be fighting a very difficult, if not impossible, battle without the evidence of life, the life of God, in the soul of human beings. Thank you very much. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.